For the sake of all beings, wisdom, compassion, non-clinging awareness, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Well, the, the, um, I always think it's marvelous how the universe kind of just rolls along in somehow the right way. And so uh, we finally get to the point where there's a sense of um, you know, the skillful fabrication of oneself as Samantabhadra, and then we're here with the painting, <laughs> just that day. <laughs> Are there any um, questions or discoveries or deepenings that you'd like to share? that which moves, pure and free, catalyzing. Catalyzing is a word? Yeah. <laughs> it's for me. <laughs> <laughs> catalyzing the flourishing of love, caring and trust, happiness and confidence, respect by the whole of the otherness. You are so legitimate. Can you see the legitimacy of me? This thing is available right now. So how to do it? Playfully understanding more and more, infinitely. Seeing the CERN. CERN is a word? The CERN? Uh, yeah, because in um, the CERN, and CERN in Portuguese is, is like center and heart. Also, discern actually is off-centered. <laughs> so Not intended. <laughs> seeing the heart, the center yes. of what happened. Without attachment, flowing to the next moment, experiencing the truth that is not static, that is always open to the eternal God change. I am this, you are this, we are this suchness moved by love. It's inevitable. Suffering arrives in the resistance of love. So come, let's manifest what is in your, our heart. And then I, I wrote this this morning and, and then I had this experience of doubt uh, just after that. So it speaks from, uh, from me deeply, and I saw the um, uh, the truth in this. But then there is this: Am I realizing this in each moment? So um, this question of how to remember this. Each moment, mm. Mm. the, the um, I make a pun, but but uh, remember shifting it into Pali, Sanskrit is sati. Mm. Shifting it back to English is awareness. How to be aware of this? 
that is the question. Right? That's that's what we, in a sense, the whole path is coming to a, a confidence of living that the answer to that. Right? So it strikes me that possibly this kind of wave of doubt that you experienced after the poem um, was just a kind of a, you, you could take it as a reflection of the depth of your understanding. Mm. Because in a sense to doubt is to, um, could be, Right? I mean, we can have different kinds of, we can have skeptical doubt and it's kind of dismissive and <coughs> non-questioning. But doubt can also be a, um, a synonym for question. And, you know, to, to be questioning is to, like if you meet someone and you have, you're not questioning at all, you're not accepting the legitimacy of them because um, you are assuming that there is a them there that you're accepting and therefore because you're not questioning you don't see that actually there's a continuous changing dynamic that is that being responding to you responding to them okay. and so you know there's a sense of the um, there's different ways of, of seeing it but I think that it's useful to not to let go of or to um, become a bit more free from any tendency we might have to see doubt as some kind of negative that that, that uh, it might be useful actually to reframe our looking at it and, and see that sort of within doubt there's also the possibility of new understandings, whereas with no doubt, you know, in other words, I already made up my mind, I'm not questioning, I'm not open for, uh, I'm certain this is the way it is. It's, you know, the, there's a, a lot of f kind of ironic phrases in, in Buddhism. Um, and one of them which illustrates this, I think, is, you know, the bodhisattva who thinks he or she is a bodhisattva is no bodhisattva at all. Mm. Right? So, so in a sense, I am suchness, end of suchness. <laughs> right? I, I, I'm, I'm speaking in a very simplistic way and, and it's subtlety of words and so on. But I mean, the, the advantage of perhaps why human beings um, give birth to kind of flows of inspirational um, poetry, vision, understanding, what have you, is, is that it's actually um, part of the, the mystery whereby we participate in our own unfolding. Right? So we kind of um, it's almost as if we, we clarify a possibility in front of us. And then and that, clarif that, that clarifying of that possibility is a sort of invitation, you know. Do you dare? Do you wish to? Will you step into this possibility? Huh? Only instead of the possibility being um, offered to you via some traditional text like the Avatamsaka Sutra or, the, or, or traditions of, of formulated vows, um, you know, bodhisattva vows and Buddhism as a kind of formulated practice. In other words, something that's kind of, we feel like it existed before we came along and then we discovered it and it was <coughs> wonderful and it invited us. Whereas this one, uh, this is an invitation which is coming up out of the living that we are and because of that it can both have a potency to invite us that's more st but stronger than any of the traditional um, expressions um, and at the same time there's the liability of doubting it because you know this kind of world is just me but then who 
gave birth to the poem. <laughs> Me, we. So, so it's, a, it's a big, it's a big thing there. If you'd like to clarify this, I mean, perhaps I'm not touching on what you're asking, but the, but this is a kind of a general response to the sense of having doubt immediately following a kind of an arising of such a, a thought, understanding, aspiration, uh, wonderment, vision. Um, you know, I, I don't like to nail it down to it, this, this. It's kind of some of all of that and none of that beyond that. Does it need to go further? No? I mean, you know, it's going further in your living, but I mean, right now in our conversation. Mm -hmm. I have a, maybe it's a question. I, I sit here with a sense that if, we, if I was to comprehend what's being offered in the teaching, then I wouldn't live with fear or worry anymore. <laughs> but I don't. I mean, for example, this situation of you being here at the front of a class, me thinking, wow, what a fantastic opportunity to ask a question, or, and then all this body stuff. And it's all kind of perfect. Well, I'm if, it, if it's perfect, what are you then talking about? I don't, well, that's, that's right. In a moment of clarity, there's no... Every response, the, the the now, the heat in the cheeks, the the body, it's all, yeah. Uh, I'm sharing a a, a dissonance mm. that, from perspective of functioning, every single experience is legitimate. Or it's, it's not. It's not objectively legitimate. It's only legitimate. I mean, it's not enough. I mean, I'm accepting what people are saying. But because I don't want to be picky or anything, and I'm trying to accept the legitimacy of what you're saying. But, but uh, when when Matirana, uh was was using that phrase in, in terms of trying to make a very very general pointing at the kind of kind of essential quality of love, right, in the human experience, he talked about accepting the legitimacy of another, coexisting with oneself. So it's so it's it's more than just it's not just saying oh they're legitimate because we could say hey, you're legitimate but I don't really want to hang out with you right because I can't handle coexisting with your legitimacy you know you vote Republican right and it's just like grates my nerves <laughs> right you understand you know like what 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 um, we could we could have a sense of I accept the legitimacy everything is legitimate. But that's that. That's still miles away from necessarily everything I can accept. We're not talking about whether a thing is legitimate. It's whether I accept the legitimacy coexisting with myself, with my living. The, the, I accept the legitimacy of this living coexisting with my living. That means I'm also accepting the ways I have to compromise in the relationship with this particular legitimacy, you know. And so that's, that's the expression of love that Maturana is getting at. And I think it's something, if you really contemplate it, it's, it's very profound. And, and, uh, and, when, and, and it's, in a sense, it's rare in terms of a general way of living, but it's not rare at all in terms of um, incidental momentary experiences in people's lives you know what I mean like like um, you know you, you uh, it's not unusual that someone might love another person no matter what kind of thing you know I mean you, you get these horrible now with m the media you know the way it is you, you you get these horrific awful horrible dark tales of human experience you know, so you imagine like someone's going along and they're happily married to someone and then 
you know, later on they discover that the person they're married to was like an absolute criminal and just stealing tons, you know, millions of dollars from other people and so on and maybe doing really nasty things to others and and then this person that I'm married to um, is taken to court and thrown into jail right and it's not totally uncommon for the person to st have to struggle with the fact well I still love them I don't agree with it I'm ashamed of it but I still love them what on earth can that mean it can be you know you can dismiss it as just some goofy clinging clinging habit but there's also the possibility that you, you know, you accept, or maybe put it in a in a less grotesque example, you know, you're you're you have a child, and the child is growing up, and there's the possibility that you accept, you 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 accept that child, in to be part of your life, in a sense, no matter what. You don't necessarily say that, but you effectively do it. You know what I mean? Like they, they, they go to school and they get fantastic grades and they win a fantastic scholarship and they become famous and they do wonderful things for everyone. And I accept my child in, in you know, coexisting with myself, right? But it doesn't always work out that way. You know, they fail, they drop out of school, they get into trouble with the law, right? And, and, uh, and you know, it's like, it's not, it doesn't mean that you can't have an opinion, right? The, 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 it's not like I have to kind of go along with everything, but I'm accepting the legitimacy of this being as they're being legitimate, um, you know, in coexisting with me, right? And as, as um, Juliana's poem is kind of hinting at, in reverse too. So, so it's not it's not conditional on whether they accept the legitimacy of you, but in a sense, they if it's like it's a wonderful thing to to have a, a relationship of genuine love, in a sense, one way. You know that, that one person really loves another being. It's an even more wonderful thing if two beings love each other. Right? It's an incredible number of relationships that totter on really well, um, seemingly, right? Um, because one of the pair, if, you know, in a, in a dyad relationship, um, one of the pair genuinely loves the other, uh, but the other doesn't. I mean, the other needs the other, the other is accustomed to being with the other, the other likes the other from time to time, you know. Uh, you don't know what you'd do without them. It fills in the boredom. It's sort of, you know, I don't get lonely. Yeah, I mean, there's like all kinds of things there, but it's different from, you know, and that relationship can still work. But it's not as magical and as wondrous, I think, like to, if you have two beings or like groups of beings that can actually have that kind of full acceptance of the legitimacy of the other whilst they're being accepting the legitimacy of the other. There's a kind of a radiance of, of um, Jivatindriya, <laughs> life energy, you know, just kind of radiating around, which is palpable to others. I mean, that relationship itself becomes a kind of a, um, an effortless gift to others who are close enough to be able to see. You know, close, I'm talking about close enough in their capacity to see, to be able to see. I don't mean close enough, you know, like so many meters away or living next door or something like that. Yeah. How do we get onto that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so just a sense it's, uh, we, intellectually, it can be an intellectual thing of figuring out and realizing it's quite legitimate, that how it's inevitable. It's not just legitimate. What else could a person be except be what they are? I get it, right? Um, but that's still not necessarily um, automatically meaning, that, that knowing doesn't automatically mean I accept that 
in coexistence with myself, you know, like, like um, you know, in relationship with myself. It's like I, you know, I accept, I mean, in England, you know, they had, uh, they loved to, they accepted the legitimacy of beings, right? Because if you didn't accept the legitimacy of beings, you just hang them, right? We send them to the colonies, to Van Diemen land, and so we have, um, you know, <laughs> Australians, <laughs> right? Kids, you know, there's a child. I mean, you have a feeling for a child, right? It's legitimate. They're starving. They steal a loaf of bread. Off you go. Transportation for life. <laughs> right? There's spillover to New Zealand too, <laughs> right? Because, because we don't want to live with them. We don't want to be in coexistence with myself. I don't want that type around, not because I'm afraid they'll steal my breath. That's not it. It's much more grotesque. It's because you believe that actually poverty is an infectious disease, right? And it will kind of catch on to you, and you don't want to pollute your, your kind of genetic thread or something with this by having this around. Or It, it was bizarre sad, suffering, right? Um, so if you were to contemplate what you were just contemplating before you spoke and see, you know, does, that, does the contemplation still hold when you, if you extend it to the fullness of that expression? I don't think it's the only expression. It's a bit mechanical and, and so on. But I think it's, it's unusual and I think it's um, a valuable expression, you know, it's it kind of, I don't know that Maturana was not the final successful human being in defining love. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a bit of a bad joke in philosophy, you know. So many people have tried to define what love is and can't. And so I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily stopped there, but from a certain aspect, because he's looking at the biology of love. He's seeing love not as just a, an emotion that's there, but he's, you know, his last published book in English, The, the Origin of Humanness in the Biology of Love, um, you know, he's seeing this, this has got to do with how we perceive and how autopoiesis happens, and it's kind of right there in this, and then to, to begin to realize this and the degree to which your cultural and and um, personal lifetime social conditioning, right, has encouraged certain confidences, certain emotional confidences of the way of the world, which can be different from our intellectual confidences. You know, it's sort of like the person can be, have a, a wonderful view of interconnectedness and so on, but they might have an emotional confidence that kind of at the bottom line, you can't really trust everyone, right? So, so that's a kind of a, a confidence, not intellectual confidence at all. They don't even, maybe not even aware that they are, wouldn't even express this, you know, as, as a, uh, oh, I'm confident that um, I don't trust people. The confidence is that when push comes to shove, you don't trust. Right? That's where you go for refuge. That's the fallback, the default setting. And so I think one of, not one of, but a major part of the, um, the effort, the, the, the kind of the, <laughs> the trials and the tribulations, if you like, that, that can go hand in hand with walking the path, right, is this um, dissonance. Right between patterns of, you know, our intellect can. You don't have to work this way. You could, you could work directly from kind of intuition and, and feeling and so on. But we live in a culture that's that's become very wordy and very conceptual, and so it's for many people a certain degree of analyzing the situation, thinking it, figuring it out, and so on. It's part and, it's the way we run our school systems, it's the way we run our government, it's the way we run science, it's the way we approach so much. So of course we're caught into this. And so most people begin their, their study of Dharma is, is quite conceptual and intellectual. And by that I mean 
they say, oh, the Dharma means this, or the Buddha said that, or the, the, you know, the teachers, the teachings, the tradition says this. And what does that mean? And can I understand it? And there's almost this, under, this belief that if I understand it, that's it. But you haven't even begun to look at your own living. You're looking at this out here. However, when it works well, it gives us a framework whereby we can, in a sense, reflect back on our own living and we begin to transform in this process. And so I think quite often people are able to come to a, I don't want to, nothing's limited, you know, there's no such thing as an intellectual understanding that doesn't have any emotion or feeling or mystery in it, but it's, it's more like when we say an intellectual understanding, we mean an understanding where the intellectual component dominates it. You know, or you could have an understanding where the, where the kind of bodily knowing dominates it. It's not to say there's not some kind of intellect in there, but it's not the dominant thing. Um, you know, you could look before Jungian functions a bit like this. Um, but we, in our culture, there's a tendency, there's probably, you know, to either, um, first of all, have a strength of thinking function first, right? Or, at least we are living in a culture where, although my thinking function isn't very strong, I know it should be, because the whole culture's set up to think I'm a failure because I don't have a good thinking function. I'm just a feeling person. Oh, I'm dyslexic, right? Or I'm, you know, I mean, dyslexic isn't a talent. Dyslexic, dyslexia is a failure. In our culture, you know, the way we talk about it, the way we, we look at it, it's, it's completely different than, than just going, oh, different types of humans, different strengths. Oh, this is an interesting strength. Well, there's, why we wouldn't we call it this something? We'd call it yeah. pro something, <laughs> prolexia. <laughs> 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 so probably we'd get rid of the lexia, you know, and call it in a completely different way. You know, instead of what we see, oh, not very good with language or writing or words or however it is that it's defined. Right? But however, you know, whether we've got it or not, we've all invested in this to a degree. And so it's, I think it's relatively easy in this day and age to come to a, some kind of understanding of the interconnectedness of everything. I mean, lots of people understand it's all interconnected, but it doesn't do a thing to their behavior in terms of climate change and, and using up the resources of the planet. The intellectual, not, they've got the intellectual knowledge, but there's a dissonance. Right? With their, well, it's exactly the same with Dharma. You know, we, we get a sense of an understanding, and then the understanding, if used skillfully, can be used to kind of almost like bootstrap ourselves into a new um, paradigm of experiencing. Right? And it takes a little bit of time. And this is like, the, and this is the, when you don't have any kind of sense of it at all, then definitely you're just muddling around trying to complete or, or, or facilitate the accumulations, right? Of wisdom, merit, wisdom and compassion, right? Um, and you're, you're trying to kind of integrate these and hopefully out of the integration you'll get some dicky bird of an idea of what is going on, right? And then every once in a while there's a kind of a a poem arises, or an understanding arises, or a, it just comes and there's a, oh, yeah, what this, oh, yes, this is what's going on. And you, there's a kind of, and you know it's the uh, juicy because it, it's got to have that, that oomph in it. If it's, oh, it's all interconnected and we're all responsible for each other, obviously, and we should care for each other. And it's just like flat note. The implications are, whoa! Yeah, you gotta, if you're not feeling that too, you're not there. Okay? But we're kind of moving in this direction. And once we do have a few of these, you know, then we get a sense of how the intellect has that, that feeling. The feeling isn't it, right? But it, the feeling demonstrates to us there's a potentiality of profundity in this understanding that might be there, and it's, it's there, and yeah, 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 yeah. Right? 
And then, then our work becomes the work of familiarization. And it's like, oh, I'm wrecking it. Oh, it's kind of lost it. Oh, I got it. Oh, I lost it. Oh, I got it. I got it now more here, right? But I don't have it um, there, you know, in, in that situation. I, you know, I mean, I, I saw this. We all have our, um, what, what to call it, like, there are places where the, uh, the grip of um, dysfunctional emotional identity is very strong, and there's places where it's less strong, you know. And so, just giving an illustration from my life, which was so graphic to me, although I don't know how it, if it, if even it appeared to anybody else, but to me it was like so graphic. I was sure anyone else in the room could see it, and it was kind of mildly embarrassing, and a bit upsetting. Mm -hmm. And and that was that, um, you know, I, I've been teaching now for 45 years or something like that, and and uh, and in the first. 10 years of teaching, I saw Rinpoche frequently, and in the first 20 years of teaching, or you know, the next 10 years, I saw him less frequently, but I still saw him. And, and, uh, and at that time, I could sit in front of a group of people and I could give a pretty good rant, right? It's kind of like I, I got a talent for just sitting down and ad-libbing on and doing it. And, and uh, and then I'd show up in class, and nothing to say. Totally mute. When, whenever he was around, <laughs> I think it'd be different. I know towards the end, right? I would challenge him and and sort of have more on the edge of conversation and so on. But it was kind of. And I recognize this is just a whole attitude with authority and male authority and so on. It was just so. Um, deeply, you know, as part of the foundation that I'd grown out of, that it's, it, it, I just didn't, you know, you're going to go, huh? But gradually, slowly, 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 right? It didn't come because I worked hard at kind of breaking through that. It came from um, familiarizing with it working well, and the kind of the the it's a bit of a flowery way of speaking, but the kind of the aura of working well extends out and touches other facets of your life, including the more difficult f facets, right? And gradually, right, a uh, kind of less dissonance is there. Right? until um, there's no more work to be done. And that's called the stage, the fifth stage of path of no practice. You're not practicing anymore, right? You've achieved. You're fully alive. You know you're alive. And you're fully willing to participate in the aliveness that is, <laughs> right? Doesn't mean there's not a whole lot of creation and unknowing in front, right? But, you know, I mean, I wonder if life is practicing in order to live. Well, I'm practicing living so that later on I'll be able to live well. It's kind of goofy to say that. You live, all, you never stop living, you're living along as we go. The um, material that I want to cover today is, is both long and short. Um, you know, we're coming to imagine for a moment in the cultivation of our work that we're starting to have a confidence about essential practice. We know in our bones this is the essential practice. I don't mean this is the essential practice, I mean this is the essential practice, you know, like, like in, in your experience. In your, your, and the confidence is there because you don't, the demonstration of the confidence 
is that you you resort to this when you're confused, when things are going badly, when things are going well. Um, it, you know, it like you know, all, all the way across. It's not just oh, maybe I can practice this on a sunny day, but it's not a rainy day thing, right? Um, uh, the confidence isn't an intellectual confidence. It's a, it's like the fact of what you do, is where your confidence lies, you know. Um, and so there's a kind of an increasing confidence in the, in what constitutes essential practice, for me, you know, of of the shape or an entry point or. Um, you know, in a sense, like the, we we nurture the hints at blessedness, the myriad faces and masks of luminous knowing. You know, like we 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 are confident of what is the hint at blessedness for my conditioning. You know, in a way that's general enough that it can be applied in quite a range of situations and circumstances. Because you might have a hint of blessedness, but it only works at ten o'clock in the morning, in the living room of uh, Tarchin and Mary's place. Um, it doesn't work at nine in the living room at Tarchin and Mary's place. It doesn't work at 11. And it, it doesn't work just out on the porch. <laughs> right? And that's marvelous that it does happen somewhere. Right? Right? And, and you might have lots of them like that. Oh, yeah, when I'm here, this is really great. When I'm there, that's really great. But essential practice to me is not just important practice. It, the essentialness part means almost like we can't do without it. That, that, that as in the flow of my awakening, this must be done. And, and in the Theravadan tradition, there are all kinds of collections of stories of awakening of various bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. And, and there's this kind of traditional phrase that you come across again and again, done is that which had to be done. Right for this, get, get the sense when the the word this is, they're pointing to themselves. Right for this, there is no more being subjected to becoming. Unfortunately, it, it it frequently gets translated as for this, there is no more being subject to becoming. And and that conjures up the idea in many people's minds that the whole purpose of is to stop becoming, is to you know, no more becoming, you know, I'm off the wheel, I'm out of here, right? Whereas if you just turn it into a verb and say subjected to becoming, you know, I'm no longer a kind of a reluctant victim of becoming, but I'm, I'm confidently and lovingly participating in this mystery of becoming, right? And, and uh, for the person to to do what has to be done, you know, to done is that which has to be done, then first of all, and it helps to know what has to be done. <laughs> and, or, I mean, or you, maybe it doesn't come first, maybe it comes simultaneously, but at that moment of knowing, done is that which had to be done, then you knew what essentially had to be done and you know that you done do it. <laughs> right? 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 And it's not a braggy thing at all, there's nothing to be said really, you know, it's just, it's just, <coughs> comes across as a as a a sense of natural um, rich presence engagement right? so so first of all coming to this kind of confidence um, recognition and capacity to activate and live with and be essential practice right? And then gradually coming out of that comes an aspiration. And the aspiration might mean, oh, um, without necessarily realizing the essential practice, I figured out, right, that we're all totally interconnected. And actually, that kind of implies that the universe is just inherently perfect, right? But there's this dissonance, right? There's this kind of, like, I, I kind of figured that out, right? But I'm not necessarily living the, all the time that that is what it is, right? And so coming out of this recognizing the essential practice, which of course gives rise to various hypotheses about the nature of the universe. Some people 
bunch of people hang out together and, and they like to say nature of the universe is essence of mind it's all mind right another bunch of people hang out and they say oh it's a big deep ecological matrix of living systems unfolding and and some other group hang out and they say oh it's just rigpa right and other people hang out and, and they go oh this is uh, Buddha, um, Buddha nature, or, right? Uh, they're, they've got these kinds of things. A way of encapsulating the possibility of, of kind of a rich, full living um, of what we intuitively have hypothesized. And so out of this essential practice, which, which inevitably you, we hypothesize, this is how we live. There's never a moment we're not hypothesizing. Okay? When I jump like that, you know, with, with this thing, there was a kind of a hypothesis that if I didn't do that, the book would fall on the floor. So I made an adjustment. I made a, I, I'm constantly looking at the situation. I'm leaping into the future on the situation, and then I'm adjusting how I am as best I can with that. We do this all the time like micro hypotheses in the course of the day and then kind of macro hypotheses about, you know, it's all four forces of physics and, you know, like Mahayana or Bodhicitta, it's kind of a macro hypotheses. And this is something, it's not optional. This is the way we function. Okay? And so in, when we're engaging with essential practice, certain kinds of hypotheses emerge about the nature of what I am and what we are and what could be, which are different than if essential practice is not occurring or I don't have a clue what an essential practice is. Or, right? um, and then out of that hypothesis coupled with essential practice comes a deepening determination to integrate the whole thing. That's why the aspiration part comes again. You know, it comes so many times through the text, but it's, it's a deepening aspiration. It's not the same. Through the practice of these meditations, may I realize the essential union of profound engagement and utter peace, the natural space of Mahamudra Dzogchen. Cultivating this openness of being in an ever-widening mandala of situations and circumstances, may I traverse the path of great bodhisattvas. May I and all beings come to realize the natural way of abiding, the vast abode of glorious Samantabhadra. Okay. So it's a kind of um, a, a, a kind of much deeper level of, I mean, if we can even think about realizing Mahamudra, there's got to be some understanding there, right? I mean, you can't, it's kind of inconceivable. Already you've done a lot of practice to be even able to meaningfully talk this way. While contemplating the following mantra, reflect on the innate purity and non-abidingness of all phenomena. In their true nature, all dharmas are intrinsically pure. Om Subhava. No, this is objective. It's out there. Not necessarily accepting the legitimacy, right, in uh, coexisting with myself, but I see that it's intrinsically pure. It's pure crap, and I'd rather it be in Guantanamo Bay, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> you know, it's pure evil, and I want to get rid of it. It's pure, uh, you know, uh, but it's not erroneous. Everything is purely what it is. It's hardly a profound statement, okay? But it is a kind of, again, it, this is comes at the beginning. It's kind of a a reminder of something, and you're going, yes, I understand this, and then what? What about how I live? How I live with this immediately present body, speech, and mind that I have in this room, in this place, with this being, at this time, with this energy, with this physiology, right? The, just the this is not a visualization to take you out of where you are and what you are. This is, this is to drop ever more deeply into what you are. Um, the immediately present body, speech, and mind of your ongoing experience with translucentizing gaze. And if you've 
been working with it so that the sadhana is real for you, then by the time you get to this phase, you've got some kind of sense of translucentizing gaze. Empowered by a deep-seated disposition to explore and come to understand the universe more profoundly and more compassionately, and there is a kind of a recognition that this is basically in me. And that's really a different kind of presence of being than when you're not recognizing that that's really in you. You know, that, that you, it's not a braggadocio thing, you know, and it's not to say that this afternoon I'll still feel the same way. Right? Because it's the empowerment isn't some, this empowerment is not some objective eternal thing that's there. It's a feeling of being empowered with this kind of attitude and understanding that is arising in the functioning that is now. So, of course, it might not be, it's not inconsistent because it isn't here this afternoon or wasn't here yesterday. It's totally consistent because it, it consistently flows out of a certain way of the universe functioning. And when the universe functions that way, boom. Okay. With this, right, body, speech, mind, translucentizing gaze, confidence in a kind of a flow that you're part of a flow of awakening, expand into the wider life of the planet. Right? And so this, this kind of opens up into a just an immensity of engagement, co of, of coexistence with countless different types of beings and dynamics and processes and so on. And so this is so big that it may be that you find it valuable to practice it twice. Um, maybe even for a whole day, you know, maybe for uh, three weeks doing this. Oh, what are you going to do for three weeks in retreat, says someone, right? Um, or three years. Or, you know, you could even see that you could fruitfully be engaged with this for, for 30 years. Or you might even consider, right, if we could just tack on a little extra so we can really expand this, the little extra is other lifetimes, you know, maybe 30 lifetimes or maybe 30 kalpas of lifetimes, right? And you start getting this picture of the Mahayana when they talk about just the, the, the kind of immensity of engagement of the bodhisattva in the process of expanding the field of wisdom and compassion. I mean, that's, that's what it, that's what extend, uh, widening into the, or extending into the wider life of the planet is. It's extending in wisdom and compassion. Now, in the very midst of this dancing matrix of multi-leveled knowing, appears a full moon of one's own heart-mind aspiration, reflecting the brilliant incandescence of the sun, the total field of all events and meanings. Okay? And the, the, the text shifts here, because now the text really obviously, well, to me, it kind of obvious, it kind of shifts from being something that's um, hopefully inspiring, but kind of didactically inspiring to now something which is poetically inspiring, you know. And if we just continue to define what the moon means, you know, as a kind of didactic thing, although I try to give a little hint there, um, you, the reason why we use symbology, right, in this kind of poetic way is that I just want you to think of all the times you have found yourself out at night gazing at the full moon, right? And, and there's certain, it, that, that experience can invoke for you uh, all kinds of rich different feeling qualities, okay? And the difference between, you know, the, the, the full moon sometimes on a, on a windy night with the clouds kind of scudding across the sky and the moon kind of seemingly appearing and disappearing, right? Um, right? Or a complete, like, 
dead calm evening, tropical mm -hmm. evening, where it's warm, just kind of by then the, the heat of the day has gone down and it's just kind of body temperature almost. And everything is like incredibly still so that like every cricket in 50 miles, you can hear them like, and the moon comes up. Well, what is, what's the quality? There's a stillness there. There's a kind of a mystery. It kind of speaks of tides and rhythms. You know, I mean, this is, it's this deep in the, you, you might think you're a modern being, right? And you are a modern being, but you're also an ancient being. And, you know, this is like you, you in the day, you know, it's all about internet and mortgages and, and, and kind of deals and, and kind of obligations and all that kind of stuff. And then the moon comes out and all of a sudden there's more than just this world. Right? And there's a something, you know, and this is kind of the moon. We could say, oh, the moon is a symbol of bodhicitta and, you know, and the, the um, um, you know, in the northern hemisphere, the myths see some old geezer in the moon the old man in the moon, but I've been so thoroughly trained, plus it really helps to be in the southern hemisphere, right, that they saw a rabbit in the moon, right? And of course the rabbit symbolizes the bodhisattva, <laughs> peace. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, if as soon as you start sort of alluding to meanings, if you like, of the symbol, it doesn't have it. But there's something there. I could, I could, um, you know, like it's quite often when a person has the experience in meditation of just sitting there and suddenly they realize they're gazing at the full moon. And you wonder, what does that mean? And you go, well, what's happening for you when that happens? And most people feel very calm and very peaceful, right? And very kind of mysterious, a sense of being mysteriously blessed. Okay. But then I have to, you know, I can't take off my other hat. There's part of my hat which likes the, the kind of poetry, you know, it's like, that's why, we, you know, we've got a skull cup and we've got a curved blade and these things still speak to us, right? Um, but also I know that the moon, you know, the, the way the ancients understood the moon was a bit different than the way we understand it, right? And, and uh, they, many of them thought that the moon was a light source in itself, whereas we see the moon as a mirror, as the mirror of the sun. And I look at this and I realize, not always, lots of times I see the moon and I don't even think about the sun, but it's possible that when I see the moon, at night, I realize it's the middle of the night and the sun's still shining. Because if you've ever been in a position, and it's not so often that it happens, that you're looking at the moon and on the other side of the world, there's a solar eclipse that's just starting to happen. The moon goes out. because there's no light to reflect off it, right? And so the sense of the moon is kind of, when, when we have light in, in, in uh, Tantrayana particularly, it's, it's, it's almost always hinting at some quality of understanding, knowing, you know, it's, it, it's, it's very simple. You're, you're in the dark, you wanna see what's there. You illumine the object with a flashlight or light, you know, and then you can see it, right? It's illumined by understanding. We illumine the world with our understanding. If we're unable to illumine the world with our understanding, we don't see it. We don't see that world. Understanding is a bit like a, a lens. We've got all these microscopes here and, and uh, um, you know, you can, many people can easily understand that, you know, the different lenses in the microscope will Will, uh, are important, you know, and they determine how big, how much magnification there's going to be or how clear, or, you know, different qualities of seeing. But what people who don't um, 
use microscopes very much frequently don't realize is that just as important in a microscope, you know, in a good quality microscope, um, uh, is the light source. And that there are actually lenses associated with the light, sophisticated lenses associated with the light source. Because if you focus the light in a different way, you see different features, different artifacts of seeing. Right? And, and so, in a sense, you could think of your understanding as, as, as a kind of a way that you, my understanding illumines the situation or the, you know, like makes it clear. But what I don't necessarily realize is that, as a, as a metaphor, that light is going out through a lens. And it's the lens of my conditioning and my prejudices and my hopes and expectations and understandings and so on and so forth. Right? So the being that I see is not necessarily the being that that being feels they are. Huh? So we, we have a kind of a light, you know. So we have this kind of illumination of the moon, right? But we know the moon is a reflection of another source of light, is the sun, right? And so it's like my aspiration to see and to understand my... my, my um, the factness of my looking and seeing and understanding, right, is a reflection, if you like, of the total field of all lookings and understandings, right? The interbeingness of the universe, because my understanding is, is intermeshing with countless other understandings. And so the total field of all events and meanings was a, was a translation that Namkai Norbu Rinpoche um, offered uh, for the word dharmadhatu. Okay? And so we see like the dharmadhatu is like the, the, is the total, is totality, it's the full monty, right? The moon of my aspiration and my lensing is a kind of a reflection of the totality. It's not separate from the totality. Okay? And so we're having a sense here you're just playing with this in whatever way it speaks to you. It might not speak to you deeply, and you may just skip on to the next thing. You may just, right, in the very midst of this dancing knowing appears the full moon of one's own heart-mind aspiration, the moon representing bodhicitta, the sun representing absolute bodhicitta, if you like, or dharmadhatu, dharmakaya, Right? And it's a kind of a reflection, right? My, my kind of modest understanding of the universe is not totally disconnected from the way the universe functions. Right? So I'm feeling this aspiration reflecting the brilliant incandescence of the sun. And the thing, you know, there's phrases in the Christian mystical tradition, no one can look into the face of God and live. You know, it's just considered too, you know, you, you're just, you know, like blinded by the light, so to speak. Okay? And so, or, or, you know, sometimes it's so terrifying, you know, we conjure up that God is Medusa. Right? So the only way we can approach Medusa is by looking at a mirror. Because if you look at Medusa directly, you turn, turn to stone. Right? And so we, we kind of, we look at the universe, the reality, by really considering our own bodhicitta, right? Even though it's kind of understanding it's a reflection there. And so the, the brilliant, if you look at the sun, you can't look at the sun. You go blind if you look directly at the sun for not very long, right? And so a lot of people, when they're observing eclipses and so on, they'll, they'll observe the sun's back there, and then they've got a little pinhole camera, and they observe the eclipse on the piece of paper out here, you know, where we've got filters to put on our telescope so we can look directly at the sun. And, and the amount of light that you're actually finally getting through the filter is something like 1%. It's like massively reduced, right, the, of the filtering to be able to look and see the actual sunspots on the surface and little tiny flares and stuff like that. Um, nowadays, we don't look through that telescope anymore because we've all been spoiled rotten with, with uh, 
the various probes that NASA has sent to the sun and come back with these glorious, massive, <laughs> detailed photographs and movies and kind of look through our microscope, you go, yeah, oh, yeah, red blob. <laughs> but, but years ago, when we first looked through, it was like, Wah! it was kind of totally hair-raising thing. I realized I've lived my entire life influenced by the sun. I am the sun. I eat the sun. I'm cradled in the sun. I'm energized by the sun. And I realized I'd never looked at it. And it was just, I remember looking the first time, I was just like absolutely staggered. I kind of staggered away from the telescope and I just, it was one of those moments, not like I said, I staggered up to Rinpoche and I just said exactly, I've been living in the sun all these years and I've been doing this and I've never seen it before. <laughs> and then I bought his filter. <laughs> right? And he, he, he used the money to buy a bigger one. <laughs> in the very midst of this dancing matrix, not separate from it, not in addition to it, right? Right there in the midst. It's just the dancing matrix is it, right? Of multi-leveled knowing appears uh, uh, or, or appears more clearly, a full moon of aspiration of one's own heart, mind, aspiration, bodhicitta. I like the word bodhicitta because for me, I don't translate it. Um, and, and I'm now having a sense of the richness of meaning that that one thing so it's become a kind of poetic image for me you know because it, it invokes many many different levels of understanding so um, it's not just this and it's not just that and hmm? reflecting the brilliant incandescence of the sun the total field of all events and meanings the light of love and clear seeing is radiating in all directions illumining every domain of existence. Like a reflection, this luminous, natural blessing of light returns. I'm, gonna, I'm just stopped there mid-sentence. Right? In a sense, the, the light of love and clear seeing is radiating in all directions. This is me in the act of more deeply appreciating right, the universe and accepting it in coexistence with myself. That's the love part, right? That's there, right? And the light return, this is very common, and you know, the light goes out from your heart, illumines all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and so on, and then it returns with their blessings, right? But you know what the blessing is? You know, you, you, the blessing's not just, you know, you, you, you go into the petrol station and take cap off your blessing tank and put the thing in there, whoosh, uh, three gallons worth, you know, and it sort of shoots in there and it's called light, you know, and it's kind of rainbow, rainbow gas, um, um, clear light gas, um, wisdom gas, compassion gas, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. No, the light is not, the light that goes out from you is not talking about some light bulb light. The light that's going out from you is you in the act of this mystery we call understanding understanding the universe, understanding otherness, understanding beingness. And the light coming from outside is not different from this, except now I'm not only understanding, but I'm feeling that I'm being seen and understood. I'm entering into extraordinarily intimate relationship with the world of seeing and being seen. Huh? This is going on. This is kind of the, the moon is reflecting the sun, the sun is reflecting the moon kind of thing. It's just like the, the, my understanding of you, right, is reflected back in your understanding of me and this is the meeting, right? And the sense of, of um, visualizing this or, or recognizing, or we could almost say uh, this is acknowledging, right? In the very midst of this dancing matrix of multi-leveled knowing, acknowledge one's heart-mind aspiration reflecting the dance of the total field of all events and meanings, right? 
the light, the illumination of love and clear seeing understanding is radiating in all directions. It didn't just start here, it's been going on all along, but now I'm really seeing this. Right? Illumining every domain of existence. And just as you might feel blessed um, when, when someone listens to you deeply or in a sense looks at you deeply or relates to you deeply, it's a kind of a blessing. It's unfortunately rare. Right? Not, and, and not only uh, is the, you know, the universe in a sense blessing you by seeing you, and we have to also reverse right, this again. You, in the act of understanding the universe, is the blessing that you, your presence, gives to the universe. It's, it's, it's mutual blessing. Okay. Like a reflection, this luminous, natural blessing of light returns, coalescing as your own true nature in the form of an all-in-one living presence. Glorious Samantabhadra. Right? Right? The, the all-in-one living presence is like, go for that. Unfortunately, you see people go, oh, and then bingo, that's there. And the only thing they're left with is, is a kind of a, a, a lovely visualization of a painting. <laughs> that's not Samantabhadra. That's a painting. It's not even really representing Samantabhadra. It's a reminder of Samantabhadra, once we've learned how it can be a reminder for us. <laughs> but the, but the Samantabhadra we're talking about is an all-in-one living presence. And so in a sense you're not moving towards experiencing it, you are now looking at the experience that's been going along in your essential practices and your translucentizing and skillful fabrication, all this work that's been going on, and now you're beginning to recognize this. Right? We could say, like a reflection, this luminous natural blessing of light returns um, revealing your own true nature to be the form of an all-in-one living <coughs> presence. Just different ways of saying a similar aspiration. Right? Smiling, breathing, present, appreciating, offering. For me this is like really important, this part, because for me this is, this is what just continuously reminds me of the profundity of the ordinary. It just feels very ordinary to me, smiling, breathing, and appreciating offering, right? Um, because I could, I've got tomes and tomes down in my library on Dzogchen and, and you know, like, like incredibly amazing texts, right? Talking about the nature of Samantha Bhadra and analyzing nature of mind and this and that and the other and so forth, right? Um, and you can kind of get lost in, it's very complex and it's very vast and subtle and um, you're not quite 100% sure you understand what they're getting at, right, and, as, as you're kind of reading, and yet something feels very valuable in this. And so, you know, for me to have an increasing confidence that the... I mean, I may be wrong, but that doesn't stop me being confident of this. <laughs> right? That I have a confidence that when smiling, breathing, presence, appreciating, offering is... is is the beingness that I am in the fullness that I can sometimes experience it. That there isn't anything more Samantabhadrad. <laughs> this is what they're talking about. It, it can be found right there. <laughs> Smiling, breathing, present, appreciating, offering, you abide resplendently. It's not even enough. It's not enough just to abide. You have to be resplendent. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I, I have to kind of do this because somehow the words aren't enough. You know, it's like there's a 
yeah, resplendent. Resplendently in both meditative equipoise and in subsequent attainment. This is referring to meditation and post-meditation. These, these phrases are used interchangeably. Right? So we talk about meditative equipoise. That's what the other day I was referring to as meditation. Um, subsequent attainment right, is um, post-meditation. So whether you're meditating or whether you're in between, you abide resplendently. You are perfectly, excuse me, um, a union of complete ease and awake, discerning engagement. <coughs> we haven't gone beyond this. You know, we seem to be just boringly the same old thing. Samatha vipassana, ease and discernment. You know, it's like these qualities. We went right, probably on page one. It was there. <laughs> right? We have ooh, penny drops. Maybe this is a key. <laughs> you are a perfectly integrated dyad of deep, unfathomable blue and dazzling, radiant whiteness. Now, it's very obvious for those of you that are familiar with more traditional expressions of sadhana texts, tantriyana sadhana texts, that this is quite a different mode of expression here, right? There's no talking about, it's not described, uh, you know, Samantabhadra appears as a deep indigo blue Buddha, right? It doesn't say that. It just, it's just total self-arising, and it's not defining how you arise at all, right? And it's like a, an invitation to, like, just as the moon can strike you, the sun has a kind of a quality. You know, depending on, it's all context. You know, the, the, um, when you're in the middle of a drought, the sun has a certain quality, it has a certain feeling, right? And then you might be in a time when it's been cold and wet and rainy for day after day after day, and, and you finally have a, like a warm, sunny day, and the sun has a totally different kind of feeling. But in the total field of all events and meanings, there's room for a huge range and spectrum of life experiencing. Right? This is coming through there. Yeah. And so, just as you could work on moon and sun, and sort of, uh, they may speak to you of something here, right? So too, you could work on just pure color, like deep indigo blue, and dazzling, brilliant whiteness. They have a feeling. You, having been raised in Canada, with lots of experiences of snow, and I mean, to be out in a, you know, after a fresh snowfall on a brilliant sunny day is dazzling. It's dazzling whiteness, right? It's kind of almost, it's, there's a quality almost of too muchness. You know, it's really strong, right? And, and, uh, and at that point, the contrast, you know, sometimes you might immediately want to put on sunglasses, which is, in a sense, going towards the blue. You know, the, the deep indigo blue can be just so, uh, you know, you want to sleep in a, in a day glow razzle dazzle room, or do you want to sleep in a kind of a deep indigo blue room if you really, really need a good rest? You know, like, like it, it, there's associations with it. I'm not saying what you should, it's far more than saying this represents that, right? And this is one of the reasons why I don't choose to distinguish between Samantabhadra and Samantabhadri. This is a, this is a yabyam presentation of Samantabhadra. And so in this one, in order to talk about it, the white part's called Samantabhadri and the blue part's called Samantabhadra, but you need them both for it. There are um, images of Samantabhadra, not yabyam, right? And it's just a single deep blue figure. Um, but in this case, it's, it's, and they'll say, oh, well, the blue symbolizes this, this is a very traditional way of speaking, and the white symbolizes that. Um, but, you know, or actually the she of it symbolizes this, and the he of it symbolizes that. And I don't like to do that, because I think we get stuck on gender. 
um, and it, it blocks the richness of r realization. So I say here, you are a perfectly integrated dyad. You, Samantabhadra, are a perfectly integrated dyad of deep, unfathomable blue. Right? And dazzling radiant whiteness. Or, if we want to say something about these colors, right, an integrated dyad of open space, all embracing and infinitely inclusive, intimately merged with serene awakeness and clear, incisive discernment. Okay? Because that kind of bright white light can illumine the edges, right, and so on, right? This is like, hmm? and you see, now, this is not necessarily the traditional Tibetan way of describing this dyad. Right? This is not a sadhana of, this is no longer, and now take it back, it's not a sadhana of Samantabhadra, it's a sadhana of the heart of Mahayana. <laughs> right? And we're using this. Right? So I'm not trying to be um, true to a, a tradition of saying this represents that. Right? I'm looking at my experience and I see that I'm a dyad of a capacity to kind of accept and allow and be present with and a, and a capacity to discern and distinguish and, and, the, and the, it's an inseparable union, right? Except now it's starting to become really there and I'm invoking images of it now because the images can, in a sense, um, extend the experience beyond what my intellectual understanding is necessarily. My intuitive comes in here. This, in this unending display, embodying knower and known, apprehended and apprehend, apprehender and apprehended, an ever fresh communion of transient parts, all is stripped bare, revealed in the translucent gaze of love and wonderment. Right? And that's the, another attribute, if you like, of Samantabhadra, is that Samantabhadra is always utterly, completely unadorned. Right? It's, it's not uncommon in the Tibetan tradition to see Haruka figures or um, naked figures, Yabyam naked figures, but they still have jewelry. Right, that, that it's, that's not uncommon, you know. They'll, they'll be wearing their earrings and necklaces and bone ornaments and so on. They're they're basically naked except for the adornments. In in Samantabhadra imagery, there's no adornments, nothing. Right, there's nothing you can nail it down and say this is this or that. All is stripped bare. Right, it's just the kind of the naked living. Revealed in and through the translucent gaze of love and wonderment. Now, once something of this is going in your being, then instruction. Look deeply into each and every manifestation of your currently arising experience. The true nature of phenomena is a dancing of ever-present translucent awareness which is ultimately indescribable, inconceivable, and inexpressible. Cultivate the subtle art of resting at ease in this unconfused state of complete authenticity and presence. So this is very much here a, a kind of practice of uh, familiarization, of acclimatization. It's almost like we're, we're reminding ourselves at a very subtle, deep level, and then Right? And then every aspect of it, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm particularly interested in the experience of looking. And you see the whole of the universe right there in that experience of looking. Or you're in the experience of analyzing something and the whole universe is engaged in that moment of analyzing. And you're looking at just being, not analyzing, not particularly trying to look, and the whole universe is involved in giving rise to this. And you begin to see that to say it's this or that, it's kind of inexpressible, right? 
indescribable. It's kind of inconceivable, right? So it's like realms within realms within realms. And, and it actually, as, as the sadhana goes on, it hints at more and more and more and more detail in this vision. This is kind of a, the simple version so far. Right? Um, but at this stage, we're getting a sense of, uh, for some people, they would have a sense of, you know, visualizing themselves in, as this figure. Right? Surrounded by the whole universe, I've tried to hint at with all the different creatures <laughs> and so on, um, <coughs> um, dynamics of life. I, I got kind of inspired with painting these Samandabhadras, and first of all, I painted a, one about this big, but the figure was exactly the same size as this one, and and uh, and I had an, a few microorganisms and a couple of animals and a little family triptych down in the corner and. And uh, that's in Melbourne right now. And then, then I wanted more world. I wanted a bigger universe, right? Bigger Dharmadhatu. So then this one got painted, but I kept the Samantabhadra the same size, right? So there's way more space to put planets and galaxies and hints at all this kind of this this the whole thing is Samantabhadra, not there's Samandabhadras, the, the object in the middle floating in the universe. The whole universe dancing is Samandabhadra. And then I got really inspired doing this one, and I conjured up in my imagination, um, you know, actually doing another Samandabhadra in my hut down below. And I was going to do it like the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> I have it all over the ceiling and right down the walls so that you were kind of in the womb of like like completely surrounded in all directions and so on. And I had such a good hoot doing this, you know, like mentally that I never quite got around to <laughs> attempting to do it physically. <laughs> There's a sense of expanding the sense of wonderment. And so if if you um, if you have a an urge and it feels fruitful to visualize yourself as this kind of traditional form, um, good, work with that. But that's not the way this sadhana is being presented and offered. It's being presented and offered at a level that I think that for me is more subtle than that. It's it's it it begins with you know all the preparation stages, everything that's led up to this point, is um, it was all there right in the preparation work. The whole thing was there in the preparation section, you know. So it's not like you finally got to the where it's at. You, you realize, I've always been doing this, and I am doing this, and I'm getting better at doing this, and I'm interested in seeing the potential in this, right? And our whole relationship with Dharma changes. It becomes very real, very alive, very in the life, the, the, the living that I am, rather than in the tradition or in the, the lineage or the what have you, right? But regardless of how important the tradition and the lineage have been in any individual's life, hugely important in my life. But, but that's not it. It's my life is all I have to work with. My living is all I have to work with. Um, so um, that's why I say it's not much. It's just a f bit of blue and a bit of white and a sun and a moon and a and, um, sense of seeing and being seen and um, just expanding into the wider life of the planet and um, familiarizing with it. That's pretty much covers it. <laughs> like that song, is, is that all there is? <laughs> we'll just sit for a moment and just see if there's any um, clarification or observation that would be useful to make.
today hundreds of thousands and I hope millions of school kids are refusing to go to school. <laughs> it's all over, not just it's all in d various different countries. In in ninety different countries, mm -hmm. the smallest number, unfortunately, apparently, is America. <laughs> right, but it's 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 immense, right? And 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 I hope it turns into I don't I don't want another baby boomer generation, but. I think we need to have a younger generation out on the streets, right? Like like we did with Vietnam and and, and in the '60s, right? Because um, uh, the wisdom whereby we organize our affairs, as demonstrated with Brexit, mm. right, is such that well, I don't think. I want to just rely on them sorting it all out, <laughs> right? And they need some pressure. Right? And so we're doing this work here, and they're doing that work there, and I don't see them as fundamentally disconnected works. Um, Were there any things you wish to ask or mention or clarify or, yeah? This is a simple question is, <coughs> why are all, sorry, <coughs> why are all the sadness visualizations set in deep blue space? Is that because it represents the totality? Why is the color always deep blue space? Um, I'm not sure that all sadhanas are set in deep blue space. I'm not. You mean all sadhana sadhanas, or you mean all samandabhadra sadhanas, or? I'd have to <laughs> contemplate that. I'm not. I'm not sure I can answer your question because I'm. I'm not. I'm not. Kind of seeing them that way. I don't see them all set in deep blue space. But. Uh, um, I mean, I think there's there's. Uh, from my perspective, right, my understanding of sadhana right, is based on um, a kind of recognition that uh, many people practice these sadhanas um, and, and, and the spectrum of people who practice the sadhanas is quite vast from people who are um, hoping for a blessing and hoping to improve their life to beings who are kind of contemplative scientists who are exploring the nature of mind and, and uh, Madhyamaka philosophy implications. It's a huge range, right? <laughs> and and uh, so the, the structure, and there'll tend to be more who are on the faith blessing side than on the really go deep into the subtlety side. You know, they get less and less as you go along. And in the, in the kind of what they call the the lower tantras, but I, I don't really like the term lower tantra because it makes it seem inferior or kind of not, you know, higher tantras and lower tantras. But but uh, maybe the, the tantras where most people begin their practice, often begin their practice, unless they're, you know, particularly personally talented, they might begin at a different level, but most people begin at the beginning. Um, it's they're very much uh, before they get very far with it. They're just training in being able to hold a sense of being a, in an, the steady presence of the deity, right? And and they don't know what the deity is, you know. They they they, they don't see it as a bunch of attributes of themselves. They see it as a bunch of attributes of Genrezi, and so um, they want some help. And so the help comes in the form of Tonka painters. And, and it's like, it's, for example, if you want to make a, a, a white look really dazzling, put it against a dark blue. And then it's really, it's just 
um, tricks of paint and canvas and effective um, iconography making, you know what I mean? And, and I think that we would be um, leaving out a factor if we didn't think that the styles of art have actually affected the way people understand these um, sadhanas to be at the beginning. Later on, well, they've gone way transcended that, but at the beginning, the, the, um, the kind of detail of the visualization and the, and the detail of the offerings and the, and the prayers, and the, it's all very structured and very formal and so on. When you get to the, to the really anutra, yoga, tantra, sadhanas, some of them virtually have no visualization, nothing. This is getting a lot closer to that this um, um, in, a, in a kind of modern vernacular kind of thing but it but it just jumps straight into real you know it goes from front to rising of you know oh, I hope I get there someday to self or oh it's so difficult to see myself as Chen Raisi and well, I can, on a nice day I can see myself as Chen Raisi but I can't see a lot of nasty people in the news as Chen Raisi I mean how can how can they be Chen Raisi, you know, a mass murderer can't be Chen Raisi, you know. So, so you, and but eventually you begin to realize that Chen Raisi is actually uh, the experience of great continuum seeing, and so you begin to realize that you are Chen Raisi. You know, at the end of the sadhana, um, you reappear as Chen Raisi in whatever form you naturally are. A lot of people think this is just a kind of a fob off end of the sudden. Oh, you know, well, I'm back to where I am now. I can get up and go and have a cup of tea. But actually, it's a very profound. It, it, it's 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 aspiring to a profound understanding. You know, at the beginning, I could be Chen Raisi with a kind of leverage of a bit of white and rosaries and flowers and prayers and all this. But by the end, my my sense of the real essence of Chen Ray Zi. Right, great continuity of seeing, understanding, mutual seeing, understanding, being seen and seeing. Right, this universe, right, is what's there. And um, you know, why would I bother the extra work of visualizing myself as white with four arms or anyone else? I don't bother. I mean, this is everything is Chen Raisi, run rampant. So it becomes very, very simple. But so what I'm so understanding that people approach sadhanas in different ways and understanding at the beginning people are looking for kind of clear things to meditate on and so the the kind of images tend to be more they're not black and white but you know like like uh, contrasty and clear because it's like I can work with this um, but then later on they just it's it's not there it's not inherently there in um, I mean I even think you know, like I don't see all Tonkas don't have dark blue backgrounds and uh, I can't think of you know they talk about you know they've got clouds and sun and chickens and piglets and snakes and a couple of sleeping deer you know it's a little bit of nature around the odd waterfall right kind of deep bl blue wouldn't let you see it all you know presumably it'd be night all the time <laughs> I don't know I just so but but anyway that's a few thoughts on the on the theme right. I mean to me um, I think there, there's a great urgency to wake up to a deeper appreciation of what we're trying to point at during this time together here. And, and I see, um, you know, some of the young people who are walking today in the streets feeling that urgency, right? And it may be that, you know, you, and, and I, it may be that for some people, and, and I'm absolutely convinced not all, but maybe for some people, they could learn how to visualize a Tibetan deity and come to a stable 
image of that and go through years of training and so on so that they can finally come out and realize, well, actually, it, it, this is a reflection of your own essence of mind. By then, the global temperature will have risen six degrees, right? And we will have lost another uncountable numbers of thousands of species, right? Um, I'm not sure we got the time to work that way. I think that we, we, we need to have more expressions of Dharma, which um, inspire people to uh, not, time, not take time out so that they can go and explore the profound, and then they can come back and make a good offering to the world. But they have a sense that there is no time out. The whole thing's potentially profound from the very beginning, right? Um, and so we can work this way. And for me, like the structure of the sadhana is, is extraordinarily valuable. I'm speaking personally. And, and that's because each part is a, a kind of reverberation and a reminder of themes which I've, over the years, put lots of time into this bit and it's opened up into a whole practice itself and there's suddenness within suddenness within suddenness kind of thing, you know. And so then you have this kind of um, poetic -y reminder of, it's almost like the path to the cessation, so the whole thing, right? Uh, which is kind of helps to hold a contemplation of how it's all fitting together. And so the sudden structure like that is very valuable. Whereas you can see aspects of this in studies of ecology, especially deep ecology, um, studies of systems, systems theory and stuff like that, but they don't necessarily, it's kind of out there, it's not necessarily having the aspiration. This one knits it all together, right? Inner and outer and so on. And so I'm borrowing from this and still, and I'm, I find this valuable, um, but I I don't know that we've got the luxury, right, to to struggle along for twenty years necessarily practicing this to finally, you know, have, with a kind of wrestling with your intuition, saying no, no, it's much simpler than this. It's just be still and know that thou art God. This is, this is, good as it gets, right? Give up all clinging and the, and the essence will at once emerge. But in the meantime, you're, you know, you're doing your hundred thousand, hundred syllable mantras and this and that and the other and doing all these retreats. And it's a kind of a wonderful thing in a world in which we feel we've got a, a, an immense amount of time, you know, like, like, and then, you know, I could be reborn in the next lifetime and do some more. And after 30,000 lifetimes, I might finally achieve right, mature bodhisattvahood, and then I could help beings. But we're living at a time now where that frame, time frame, doesn't have a lot of meaning, you know, if it ever had meaning. You know, I mean, it's like, it's, um, it's hard to conceive of what the world will be like 50 years from now. Never mind, you know, the idea that I could just work forever. It, it's, there's an urgency here. And so I think what it's valuable is to somehow be able to respect and resonate and support each other's moments of intuiting the profundity of living and, the, and feeling the kind of wonderment about it and saying that those qualities are really worth nourishing because with those qualities, however you live will become a path of awakening. Right? Whatever you do will become, um, you know, uh, uh, an activity of awakening. And without that, you know, arguably nothing that you do could be the most holy practice and it wouldn't be. So, if we could just kind of polish this off today, then tomorrow we can get to the mantra. <laughs> By the power of these wholesome activities, may our lives be rich with awakening. Living thus, may we abandon all unwholesomeness. Through the endless mystery of living, may we help all beings to realize their true nature. Our true nature. True nature. Cyber Monk Long. Mm -hmm.